Hello, everyone. Welcome. I see we have a lot of people here today. We're very happy to, to meet you. We're going to wait just a few more seconds and allow the stragglers to get in. So thanks again for joining us. We're very excited to talk to you about college admissions today. Okay. Hi, my name is Brian McDonald, and I'm the Director of Client Relations for Anja Education Consultants. And what we're going to do today is spend about 30 minutes outlining how we have successfully approached college admissions for the last 10 years with specific examples and case studies. And then for the balance of our time, we are going to answer your questions. And now for introductions, Anjali Mazel is a former Princeton University interviewer, TED Talk speaker, and nationally recognized college admissions expert. She is also a very proud mom of a thriving 26-year-old, now in graduate school. At Anja Education Consultants, we have helped hundreds of students get into their top perfect match schools, including Yale and Stanford, Johns Hopkins, and Vanderbilt, Swarthmore, and UT Austin, just to name a few. Welcome, Anjali. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. So glad to be with you today. So I know that many of you are here because you can clearly see that applying to college has become much more challenging. And many of you are probably feeling some mixture of excitement and anxiety. So let me first begin by just acknowledging that I truly understand these feelings as a parent and a professional. And by the end of this talk today, after I outline the specific challenges and solutions, I think you're going to feel much more clear and in control of the process, but also confident and aligned with what you truly want. So I'd like to start by telling you a brief story. I grew up in New York City and went to an extremely competitive high school. Just to give you an idea, I usually had five to six hours of homework every day, and I really felt oppressed by it all. I did well despite that, but I could not wait to get out of there and go to college. And my senior year in high school was truly bizarre. My classmates and their parents got together and offered me cash to withdraw my applications after I was admitted early action to Yale. And apart from my feeling very unsettled uh, by this, I had not really decided if I wanted to attend that school. I wanted to see what other options opened up for me in the spring. And as it turned out, I ended up going not to Yale, but to Princeton instead. But this experience left me feeling really uncomfortable. And so when I was planning my son's education, I was determined that he would not suffer that kind of crushing, toxic academic atmosphere that I had endured, which I did not feel really served me in the long run. I wanted my son to be happy first and foremost, and also successful, but how to strike the right balance. The difficulty started with choosing a high school for him. We went back and forth between competitive, well-known prep schools and a small, unknown school that prioritized love of learning and independent projects. I realized that either way, there would be trade-offs. But in the end, I chose the small school where my son found his passion. And given that I had been an interviewer for many years for Princeton, as well as a teacher who wrote letters of recommendation and gave college essay guidance, you'd think that it would have been easy for me to guide my own son through this college applications, right? No, not at all. So I ended up hiring a colleague to work with him. And after many months, at the end of a surprisingly complicated process, he was admitted into an Ivy League school but that is not what he chose. He made what some might consider an unexpected choice. And I'll tell you all about it at the end of the webinar. So what I want you to know is that I have been where you are. And although I knew the system well, when my son applied to college, I had complicated feelings. Like many parents, I was vulnerable to confusion, frustration, and fear. But I did learn something important. I discovered that my son, like all of you here today, was facing a threefold problem when applying to college. Number one, increased competition. Number two, complexity of the application process. And number three, the rising cost of college. Now, what does this challenge look like in practice? 
First, let's consider the competitiveness of college admissions. If you were a Texas student in the 90s and graduated at the top 20% of your graduating class, you were automatically admitted to the University of Texas at Austin. Today, you'll need to graduate in the top 6% of your class. If you were applying to Yale in the 90s, you had an 18% chance of admission. Now it's under 5%. And 70% of USC applicants were admitted in the 90s, but in 2022, it's now under 12%. And maybe some of you read a recent Wall Street Journal article about a young woman who got a 1550 on her SAT, a GPA of 3.95, phenomenal extracurriculars and leadership positions. She applied to top tier schools only and shockingly was admitted to none of them. So there's no doubt that college admissions today is super competitive. Now let's look at the complexity of the process. 20 years ago, you might have applied to one or two schools. The process was clear, simple, and straightforward. And now because of the many moving parts of the applications, as many uh, as eight to 15 colleges for students that we work with. So there was a lot of Thing, there are a lot of things to say on top of, and the complexity is increasing. As you have probably heard, ChatGPT and other generative AI are already impacting and will continue to impact how colleges view student essays. Admission staff are looking for new ways to make sure that a student is who they say they are in their writing. Additionally, in the face of the recent Supreme Court decision about affirmative action, colleges are going to have to dig deeper to understand what each student brings to the college community. At a recent meeting I attended with UCLA, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and University of Washington admissions directors, I understood that what matters most in applications in the face of these changes is what has always mattered, students sharing their authentic lived experience. And if their lived experience was, was impacted by being underrepresented, then in the essays, they can tell their story. And to give you a glimpse into the complexity, take a look at all the elements that should ideally be in place for students to have optimal merit, scholarship, and admission results. And recently, a friend of mine was telling me about the ordeal of helping his son through the college application process last fall. The number of different essays for each college, the completely different online applications to fill in, SAT prep, coordinating with his school to send letters of rec, different deadlines, additional applications, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this was a ton of work, created months of tension with his son. So clearly, this complexity has to be simplified. Now, after the complexity and competitiveness of college admissions, the fact is that college has gotten incredibly expensive. If you look at this graph, embrace yourself. This really illustrates how the cost of college tuition has exploded. The red line here on the bottom is the rate of inflation. And as you can see, the black line on the top is the rate of increase in college tuition. Clearly, college tuition has massively outpaced inflation for decades now. In 2023, private colleges can cost up to $91,000 per year, while in-state tuition for public schools can cost up to $29,000 per year. But here's the good news. Merit scholarships can be worth tens of thousands of dollars and even hundreds of thousands of dollars. So how do we do this? Here are three quick success stories which illustrate how we guide students to gain a competitive edge, simplify the complexity, and maximize scholarships to reduce the cost of college. Let's start with Tony. When he, we began working together early in 10th grade, Tony had high A's and an SAT score in the 1500s. He was stellar in math, so his teachers and family were naturally pushing him toward engineering. But after talking with Tony, he made it very clear that engineering was not what he wanted. However, and this was the great game changer, we discovered that he had a significant talent and passion in art as well as STEM. So we matched him to a local art mentor and a summer program to develop a portfolio, the very portfolio that he could then include with his application. Exploring his interest in visual arts and combining this with his talent in math led Tony to discover a passion for architecture. 
And this discovery made all the difference because it made Tony really stand out. Why? Because now Tony had a story to tell and nothing will make you stand out from the crowd more than having your own story that demonstrates genuine passion and growth. So to summarize, Tony discovered his passion. We simplified the application process, guiding him to a clear major and a path he loved, architecture. Tony secured a $100,000 scholarship to Tulane, and by curating his art portfolio and targeting his essays to align with architecture and his new vision for himself, Tony found a competitive edge. He was admitted to his first choice, Rice University, and is there now majoring in architecture. What's the takeaway for you? Think about and discover your passion. Link that passion to your profile and your talents and then make it your own unique story so you stand out from the crowd. But not all of us are straight A students like Tony. Many of us get A's and B's. We might have a down year, get sick, or be in a competitive high school, but we're still ambitious. This was Ellen. Ellen had a B average from a competitive high school, but was confident about thriving in a selective college. We discovered that her GPA had significantly improved over the three years of high school through her hard work. When she got Bs, it motivated her to get tutoring and find a college professor as a mentor. And she kept signing up for challenging classes. She also rose to a leadership position in yearbook and got a summer internship in a startup incubator to explore a major in business. But how was she going to pull all these threads together to showcase her accomplishments. Ellen worked to tell her story in a compelling way. You can tell your story in a way that really showcases your evolution and your growth. Ellen demonstrated through her essays and applications how she learned from setbacks and how these setbacks and how these setbacks led to her development and improvement. In fact, they became assets. Maybe your child or you are like Ellen, you discovered a specific passion halfway through high school. Maybe you began to excel by the end of junior year, or maybe you're a straight A student who has a clear major from the beginning. Either way, you may not recognize what is exceptional about you, but everyone has a powerful story to tell. You can tell your story in a memorable way, your passions, your challenges, your successes. So to summarize, for Ellen, she simplified the application process by keeping accountable and breaking down the long list of tasks into small steps. Ellen submitted standout applications, and she eventually received 12 scholarship offers, ranging from $20,000 to $100,000. And she gained a competitive edge by pulling all her academic and extracurricular experiences together into a compelling story in her, the essays and her interviews. So despite her GPA, she was admitted as a business major to Emory University, her first choice. So what's the takeaway for you? We all have problems and sometimes failures. Look for the challenges and setbacks you've overcome to tell a compelling tale where you are the hero of your own story. Now, Grace's story is slightly different. She had an A, B mixed GPA, no test scores, and a remarkable singing talent she needed to showcase. So what was the solution to the threefold problem of college admissions for Grace? First, to simplify the process by staying organized and on task through spreadsheets and an application tracking system. Second, to keep costs down by maximizing all aspects of the applications and tailoring the college list in Grace's case. She was awarded scholarships ranging from $80,000 to $199,000. Third, as Grace was a singer, she gained a competitive age, edge by curating her vocal submissions and helping her that helped her get admitted to the super selective Grammy camp. In the end, she was accepted to her first choice college, the very prestigious California Institute of the Arts. So what is the takeaway for you in this case? If you have a standout talent, get in position to tell your powerful story by participating in competitions and prestigious summer programs. Make that talent the center of your applications and allow your test scores to take a back seat. So 
The three students we discussed, Tony, Ellen, and Grace, were all success stories, but very different from one another. Yet for all of these students, they solved the problems of competitiveness, complexity, and cost of college. And through these three case studies, we hope you've gotten some valuable tips on what to prioritize. Now, before we answer your questions, let's answer the most common one, which is how you can work with us. There are three simple options, but before that, let's check out our tra track record. In 2023, our average scholarship per student was, was uh, $80,000. The return on investment for our families was very high and our fees were paid for many times over. In this same application cycle, students we worked with were admitted to some of the most selective colleges in the country, including Stanford, Dartmouth, University of Pennsylvania, Johns Hopkins, as well as excellent schools such as UC San Diego, Penn State, Ohio State, and Texas A&M. And best of all, these were also the right fit for each student. So if you want to gain a competitive edge, simplify the application process and keep costs down like the hundreds of students we have helped, here are the four simple options for different budgets. Option number one is for eighth to 10th grade students students. With the one-year early talent development packages, we have time to identify your kids' talents, discover their passions, and make sure they really get on track. This option also maximizes admissions and scholarship results when they apply to college. We will help optimize their GPA, test scores, extracurriculars, and summer planning. Packages start at $29.97. Option number two is for 11th and 12th grades. Our A-list application package, our most popular one, will give you a competitive edge, simplify the complex application process, and keep costs low. We will help optimize essays, SAT prep and testing, summer planning, as well as demonstrated interest. And this package costs $12,997. Option number three is for 11th and 12th grades as well. This college advisor package is the same as the A-list package, but instead of working with me, you work with an advisor I have handpicked and trained, and the cost is $79.97. So if you're serious about working with us one-on-one, -on -one, please sign up for our free discovery session and bring your questions. Students, please have both parents with you, so sign up for when they are available, and parents, please bring your spouse. Our wonderful moderator, Sydney, is now going to drop the sign-up link in the chat. So just to recap, families hire us because the return on investment is high, not only from the point of view of scholarships, but also from the point of view of acceptances and increased odds of admission. So once again, uh, Sydney, if you would be kind enough to put that link in the chat, that would be fantastic. Now, before I answer your questions, I want to finish the story about my son who applied to college a few years ago. At the end of the process, as I mentioned, he did in fact get into an Ivy League school, but that is not what he chose. Instead, after a lot of research, investigation, deep reflection, and a visit to campus, my son chose an amazing school, Carleton College in Minnesota, which you may not have heard of, but turns out employers, graduate schools, and prestigious fellowship boards know very well. It was by far a better choice for him than the Ivy. At Carleton, my son got more attention. Classes were more targeted. His professors advocated for him. He stood out. And after his freshman year, he was awarded the Orion Mission Internship at NASA and a second Orion Mission Internship at NASA the following summer. Today, he's in grad school at an Ivy League college and tells me that in retrospect, although some disagreed with his college choice, this was absolutely the right decision for him. And best of all for me as a mom, he's happy and thriving. So parents and students, you may be anxious right now, but I can assure you that there are many roads to success. Please remember that college is not a destination. The college application process actually help you begin to discover your purpose. 
a great first step in designing a life that's meaningful and financially stable. And that's what I wish for all of you. Now, let's see what questions you're asking. And as I start to answer them, uh, if you would, uh, if you would, um, Sydney, please drop the sign up link again in the chat. For the one-on-one -on -one, uh, discovery session, students, please bring your parents. So sign up for when they can attend. And parents, please bring your spouse. Okay, wonderful. So let me get started with a Q&A. Yes. So um, what is more important, having an internship or dual credit course for college and high school credit? This is from Nina. Yeah, you know, um, I kind of wish you didn't have to have an either or, right? Um, if you have to make a choice and you only have time for one, then what's important is not so much uh, whether one is better or worse, but which one will allow you to, number one, showcase the strengths that you already have. Number two, gain more clarity about the direction you wanna go in, in terms of a major and career. Really one of the things that sets us apart and what I want to encourage all of you to do is to place your long-term success and well-being on a par with achievement. There is a way to have both purpose and performance. And there's a lot of power in that. Uh, there's a way that you can um, still achieve a lot without sacrificing well-being. So that's, you know, this is the path. Now, um, how does that play into this internship or dual credit? Well, you know, you don't want to overschedule yourself, but you also want to choose opportunities like an internship or a dual credit course or both that will allow you to both um, understand yourself better and uh, get a resume that that is uh, very substantial. Okay. Do admission officers first filter applicants by scores and resume before they read the essay, or do they read the essays regardless? Colleen, great question. So each college has its own process, but if you have to uh, place the order of importance of the different criteria for college admissions. For sure, the most important thing is going to be academics, rigor of the curriculum, those two things. So um, how a student has done academically, you know, that is going to be the most important factor. Now, if a student has struggled, for example, for a year, there are places on the application to specify, to explain that, like the additional information section in the writing area of the Common App. It's really important for students to feel that they can explain if their grades have been truly affected, right? Um, and also remember in terms of scores, uh, there, are, there are all sorts of strategies. You know, we promised you in this webinar that we were gonna talk about some uh, game-changing strategies. And, you know, one of them truly is deciding whether you're going to submit school scores or not. Another one is um, whether you're going to apply early decision, early action, or regular decision. For some very selective colleges, early decision can um, double, triple, or even quadruple your chances of admission. Why is that? Because colleges are uh, some of them, the ones where uh, they, that where it really matters for them, whether you choose their school or not, because their yield is, is not very high, but they're still very good schools. Um, they're going to try to, some of them are going to try to fill up their freshman classes through early decision. Early decision is when you commit to one school. Early action means that you get the answer early, you submit early, but you don't have to commit to the school. So, um, you know, you're asking, will they read the essays? Well, uh, my answer to that is try to maximize your odds of admission by using all the most um, kind of cutting edge strategies that you can. And, um, you know, they may or may not get to the, uh, to, to the essays, but you still have to submit the best essays that you're capable of because, you know, uh, in many cases, even uh, especially if you've explained why 
you maybe struggled in a semester or a year, they will go on to read the essays, okay? All right. How important are AP courses during high school? How many AP courses do typically top universities look for? Right. So that's an important question. Um, what is important, as I said earlier, is rigor, right? Rigor of the curriculum. What does that actually mean? What it actually means, means is have you made use of the academic opportunities available at your school, number one, and number two, have you challenged yourself? Now, the balance is always a little tricky because, yes, we want to show rigor in the curriculum, and AP is one way of doing that, um, but we also want to be sure that that GPA is, you know, as good as it can possibly be. So sometimes taking too many challenging classes will uh, end up adverse, adversely affecting the uh, GPA. On the other hand, as I pointed out in Ellen's case study, you know, she kept taking um, an example of a class she took. She took organic chemistry, even though, you know, in the end, she's interested in business. But she was she was genuinely fascinated with organic chemistry in high school. And she got a mentor to help her out. You know, I think she ended up with a B or a B plus, um, which for that uh, subject is, is pretty good. But what I'm trying to say is it's a balance and you have to find out um, what is your sweet spot uh, so that you are challenging yourself? Now, is there a, a magic number? There's not a magic number. But on the other hand, you know, the reality is that there, you know, colleges cannot admit, uh, you know, 50 or 100 students, generally speaking, the selective colleges, they can't admit a, a huge number of students from each high school. So within the high school, they are going to be seeing uh, you know, they're going to be comparing students and they're going to see, you know, which students challenge themselves, which students did not so much, right? But keep in mind that whether you are, um, you know, a, a very high achieving student with um, high grades in multiple AP classes or not, there are some amazing colleges out there that will uh, be a great fit for you. What you should focus on is fit, college fit. Uh, all the criteria that go into college fit. Okay. Um, yes, A Alexander, I'm not really sure what your question is about only having one parent. So maybe you can specify that. Um, yeah, Gage, what's the biggest thing that a college will take away from their uh, application? Um Yes. What part of my application will they view that determines if I'm qualified or not? Okay. So this is this is a question that if we could wave the magic wand and make all the, you know, the veils that separate uh, the you know our knowledge from rea reality, if we could make that go away and have a formula, you know, that would be ideal. Um, Colleges do not reveal that, right? They don't reveal that. But holistic admissions is really, that's the great thing about the U.S. system compared to uh, systems in a lot of other parts of the world. There are many chances for students to show what they're capable of, right? Um, there's the academic route. There's the extracurricular route. There's community service. There's, you know, students who have have significant family responsibilities. Um, colleges are looking for hardworking um, students who are going to contribute something to a value to the college community, right? At all different levels. Now, if you're looking at an Ivy, right? These days, um, many, if not most of the students who are actually being admitted to those schools are students that, you know, they're nationally or internationally ranked in some way. They've won competitions, they've distinguished themselves. But, you know, that's just such a tiny fraction of the colleges that are out there and that are available and that will lead to personal fulfillment and long-term success. So keep an open mind, understand, but it is helpful to understand the system, right? It's helpful to understand that, again, you know, it's what we said at the beginning. Um, the way that college admissions looks today is radically different 
from the way that it looked 20 or 30 years ago. So we just kind of have to, um, you know, it's it's better to, to see how what you have accomplished fits in with the possibilities for a variety of universities. Now, if you're, of course, if you're starting this process or if you're a parent and you're thinking about this process uh, four or five years in advance, of course, there are things you can do to help position a student to be in a, in a very strong uh, position for admissions in 11th grade. Um, but, um, you know, and, and we certainly work with students quite early to help them develop their talents. That's the whole idea of talent development that we have, uh, that we have perfected this, this idea. But, um, you know, it's not going to be, so what does it take to stand out in college admissions? It's different for different students, as you saw with the three case studies. Um, what you want, though, in all cases, is you want to have a powerful story to tell. Um, and in, in many cases, to have kind of um, a personal brand, something that you really believe in, that you really stand for, uh, because um, the story, the story about how you have um, navigated high school and overcome difficulties or uh, used opportunities uh, that is going to be your biggest asset in this process. Okay. Um, let's see. Yes. And the examples, this is from Chris. And the examples, it seems that all the students that I guess in the case studies uh, knew their future career goals. What would you just say to someone who is unsure? Excellent question. So basically, um, there are students who, for a variety of reasons, may not know what direction they want to go in. Some of them are Renaissance kids, what I call Renaissance kids, because in the Renaissance, um, the idea was that you, uh, you, you were interested in a lot of different uh, areas that today we separate. We put these categories like STEM on the one hand and humanities on the other hand and the arts in another bucket. The Renaissance, all of these came together because they were all, they're all fields of human development. So um, there are now many majors. Uh, colleges look very favorably for the most part on interdisciplinary study. Some colleges even have a create your own major option, right? Why is this helpful to for future employment, for law school, for medical school, for um, you know, internships for other graduate programs, because often these interdisciplinary programs help um, help train students in critical thinking and other soft skills, communication, uh, other soft skills that, uh, according to the World Economic Forum and the McKinsey Report, are going to be more and more in demand with the rise of AI. So if we look at the future of jobs, you know, as students who have these skills that are developed by some of these interdisciplinary majors can actually be uh, an asset. It can be it can be an asset for them. So there are uh, either those majors or there even are paths within each college for the most part. I mean, there's some exceptions, but many colleges have an undecided path. And that's perfectly OK. What we do recommend is if you apply undecided you have two or three areas that you have explored during high school and that you're interested in and you're able to tell the colleges, yeah, I'm undecided, but I'm very interested in X for these reasons. I'm extremely interested in Y for these other reasons. And I'm super interested in Z for another group of reasons, right? So just because you're not sure doesn't mean you can't investigate and deepen your interests because eventually um, you know you'll see either you're going to combine your interests in a career that uh, you know allows you to do that or um, you know after doing an interdisciplinary major you'll get more clarity and that one can even then lead as I said to uh, very uh, kind of um, targeted professional schools like law and medicine and uh, all of that. Good. Okay. So, um, yes. Um, 
How much, yeah, good question, Allison. How much do admissions officers look at a student's social media presence? Yeah. So studies and surveys have shown that many colleges are now looking at social media. In fact, it, you might have seen in the news uh, over the last few years, there were cases where students came out in a very kind of, um, uh, let's say, negative way on social media and their admission was revoked. So that's the kind of that's the kind of aspect what I what we call cleaning up your digital footprint. You really want to be sure that you uh, that what you put out there on social media is really the way that you would want to be treated and uh, the way you want to be perceived because um, it can impact your future and also, you know, um, helps this helps students cleaning up the digital footprint helps students to really reflect on is this the message that I want to be sending that's the kind of cleaning up part and then there's the using social media to connect with colleges so students who work with us work with a LinkedIn specialist and uh, who helps them create a LinkedIn profile and then they can connect with colleges it's one more way to tell your story Right. So social media can be very powerful in helping a student tell their story, connect with colleges. Um, do all colleges look at all social media profiles? Obviously not. They don't have the time. But the point is, at least the students we work with, uh, what we try to do is help maximize every single possible thing it could lead to an enhanced admission result, but it's not just enhanced admission result. It's also a higher scholarship offer. So we we want to be sure that we're, you know, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's so that um, we give students the maximum advantage. Okay. Um, yes. So let's see. Yeah, this is a good question. What if you don't have, this was from anonymous attendee. What if you don't have an interesting story to tell? I feel like I'm pretty average. Well, this is the interesting part. Um, often teenagers don't see their qualities. Uh, I noticed this when I started working in this field a long time ago. It was my first job out of uh, out of college and I was helping students even then, uh, work on their college on their college essays, and I, after talking to students, you know, and asking those questions, I started to see, wow, you know, they have some amazing strengths. So, what I uh, recommend that you do, if you feel that you don't have a powerful story to tell, focus, uh, get some friends together, ask them, what do you think my strengths are trusted adults or parents, what do you think my strengths are? Start from that. And what you want to do is use those essays. It doesn't have to be a dramatic story, right? Sometimes students think, oh, for my college essay, it has to be something super dramatic. Not at all. Some of the best essays that I've ever read have been about uh, very what's what would might be considered kind of small events like a relationship between two best friends in high school and how that um you know how that affected the uh, the student who's writing it how that that affected their understanding of the world um there's now for example a um, prompt on the common app called reflect on something that somebody has done for you that has made you feel grateful, okay? So don't think in terms of big drama, think in terms of growth, growth and development, right? Because we each have our journey. And sometimes it's, um, the story is about major setbacks. Sometimes the story is about um, growing in, uh, you know, in a, in, in a way that is only internal through a relationship. There are a lot of different ways. Of course, some stories are very dramatic, right? So, um, but just go into this with that confidence. And I'm telling you, right? I've worked with hundreds of students. I've been doing this for a long time. 
I can tell you, you have, I can tell you for sure, you have a story to tell, right? You may not see it right now, but, um, you know, if you're, if you're not working with me, then, then try to get feedback from people who know you and then start to, um, reflect, look at those prompts and, uh, from the, you know, the uh, personal statement, something might, uh, might awaken your imagination. Okay. Um, yeah, Chris, lots of the college admission info on Reddit suggests that many college schools are moving away from the significance of test scores, national merit scholars, et cetera. And I would like your opinion. Yeah. So, you know, um, the, the issue of test scores is that some, uh, a growing number of colleges uh, feel that these tests, the SAT and the ACT, do not um, do are biased. First of all, and second of all, do not reflect college readiness. They reflect the student's um, ability and a willingness to prep for the test. So you know, um, in in the college's search for ways to level the playing field and enhance access to underserved communities, uh, this has come up again and again, right? And if you look at the trend, I mean, since um, there were some schools that were test optional, but since COVID, it's gotten even more uh, pronounced, right? And some schools, they keep pushing it off. They say, okay, we'll be test optional for another year, and then it get, the year goes, and then it's for another year. Um, so, you know, there is, there is a visible questioning of this. Now, until they're completely eliminated, like for example, the University of California system, UCLA, UC Berkeley, UC Davis, et cetera, until all colleges are like that, which, are, which means test blind. So even if you sent the scores in, they wouldn't even consider them. Until that happens, we're still advising students to prep for the tests and to try to do the best they can because will in the current climate, will a very good test score help admissions and scholarships? It will, definitely. So we're, but we tell students, take the pressure off in the sense that if, you know, there are some students that are just not good test takers and no matter how much prep they do, they're gonna hit a plateau or it's just not their strong suit. So there are so many other aspects of the college uh, application that can be featured and uh, you know uh, optimized. So depending on the student, you know, we might tell them don't even spend any time on test prep. For the most part, though, we say let's see the highest score you can get, and then we can decide if we're going to help you have you submit the scores or not. Um, National Merit Scholarship used to be a very, very prestigious scholarship. Um, now it is still a good, worthwhile scholarship, absolutely, which comes from taking the PSAT. And then um, students are kind of compared uh, to the percentiles around the country. Um, it's $2,500 um, a year. It's not nothing, right? Uh, but, um, it, it, you know, it has it has become a little bit less, um, a little bit less prestigious over the years. So, you know, do we ask students to do their best on the PSAT? Definitely, you know, because this is money. And, um, but, uh, but again, you know, it's not going to be a make or break uh, for college admissions, that's for sure. Okay, um, yes, is it smart? to ED to an Ivy League. Uh, I plan on doing uh, early decision to UPenn, but, and then the message got cut off. So I don't know what the second part of your message is. Um, so, you know, the ED uh, for Ivies, um, in some schools, there is an advantage. You look at the Cornell ED, for example, um, there, is a, there is a boost for sure. But remember that in the ED cycle for these schools like the Ivies, uh, they have reserved certain slots for um, in ED for the recruited athletes. They've reserved certain slots 
for uh, legacy. You know, most of the uh, students whose, whose parents or family attended the school will apply in that uh, in that cycle. So, you know, it still helps, sure, to say you're my first choice school. But in terms, it depends why you're doing it, right? If you're doing it because it's your really your first choice and you would love to go there and you'd be willing to give up all your other uh, applications if you're admitted, um, sure. But, you know, don't go into it thinking for these specific kinds of schools. Remember, I said there are some schools where it doubles, triples, quadruples your chances. Places like American University or Tulane, those are places where, yeah, you want to go there, apply ED because it's going to be, it's going to make a big difference. But with an IV, it's, it's not so much in terms of, um, boosting your chances as it is in turn, you know, it's good to demonstrate your interest, although they don't need it, right? Schools like that do not need demonstrated interest. And they might even say, we don't even look at it. Um, some of them do, some of them don't, but the point is, you know, of course, if you get admitted, uh, then you're done, right? You find out in mid-December and you're completely done. And that's really nice. So, but, but just go into it with open eyes, understanding the difference. Okay. How do ACT and SAT, Giselle, how are SAT and ACT different? SAT has um, fewer questions. They're a little bit trickier. ACT has more questions. They are more straightforward. If you're good on speed and accuracy and speed, ACT might be better for you. If you are better with, um, you know, a slower pace and more, th you know, th thought out questions, then SAT might be best. But when students work for us, with us, um, we give them an hour diagnostic. Um, Another thing you can do is you can take a full length SAT and a full length ACT, and there are conversion tables available online. You can compare and see which of the two uh, you would most likely uh, be able to score higher on if you uh, if you prep. Okay. Uh, Haley, when choosing a package, will there be guidance and assistance working through the essay process, including reading final and giving input? Absolutely. This is one of the main components of our uh, application packages. So um, we have a very robust system uh, to help students get from brainstorming the topics all the way to the polished final draft. But um, these essays, you know, what's what takes time is that uh, it is it's the essays that each student is truly the best that they're capable of. So we're bringing that uh, helping bringing that out of you. But absolutely, it's included. OK. Um, yes. Um, yeah, so Roshli Savidra, if you are in ninth grade, can you apply for scholarships or do you have to have and be in a specific grade to apply for scholarships? So there are different kinds of scholarships. Some of them are available absolutely to ninth graders. Look at niche.com. There are a bunch of different um, third party scholarships that's outside organizations, outside of the colleges that offer all sorts of scholarships. Um, we recommend um, uh, Be Merry. Um, uh, Mary.com and then um, and you know fast web there are a few uh, there are few uh, websites out there that are really good um, to find scholarships that are targeted for you but for the large item scholarships like the ones that we mentioned that our students have obtained those are all scholarships offered by the colleges those you really cannot apply to until you are submitting your application. And that is between 11th and 12th grade in the summer or during the fall of 12th grade. Okay. Um, question, how should I organize my essay? A heading for each category? Okay. There are many, many creative ways of writing these essays, right? We've seen excellent essays that are just a straight essay with no headings. We've seen really excellent essays that have chapter headings 
we've seen, um, you know, essays that are written like, uh, you know, more like a poem, but still very understandable. I mean, you know, there are many, many ways. When in doubt, keep it simple. But uh, also, you know, you can feel free to explore uh, with some creativity. Just run it by trusted adults, uh, people that, you know, are savvy about college admissions, because we we want to be sure when we work with students, we're thinking about the audience. Who is going to be reading these essays? What is the purpose of the college essay? It's to give uh, give admissions a window into qualifications and strengths and um, challenges that you that you have that don't appear elsewhere. Okay. Um, let's see. Yes, my child, NAMI, is, my child is a senior, is, is it too late to get an advisor? It is not too late to get an advisor. Um, many of the, um, uh, many of the deadlines are in January, but there are also later deadlines. There are later de deadlines in February, in March, there are even deadlines in the summer. So it is absolutely not too late to get an advisor. Okay. Um, yes, the success rate, Martha, success rate of your program in gaining admission and scholarships to top colleges. All you have to do is go on our website and see the testimonials of parents and our list of acceptances. And um, really our track record speaks for itself. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, Mahum is asking, is it worth graduating high school in your junior year? So, you know, um, that it depends entirely on why you're doing it, right? If you're doing it because you've taken advantage of all the opportunities that you can in your high school, or if you've really outgrown, you know, you're kind of emotionally ready to move, uh, move out of the nest and, and um, explore other um, academic and social options. It can be, it can be good. We, every year we have students that we help that uh, graduate in three years, um, but it really has to fit you, your goals, your aspirations, and also your level of maturity uh, so that you can make that transition to college in a positive way. Okay. Um, Let's see. Uh, Kiara, do colleges look at all your high school grades from freshman year to senior year, or do they mainly focus on a specific year? Um, the cumulative GPA that you're going to get uh, at the end of your junior year when you apply to college is going to be, uh, it's going to include the freshman year. However, uh, colleges if you have an upward trend in grades, if freshman year was just super hard and a lot of people have been have had this experience also because of COVID, don't worry about it. But what you want us to do is tell your story, okay? Say what you struggled with. Um, if you've had mental health issues and you need to explain that that's kind of what led to a dip in your grades, but now you've turned things around, that's absolutely fine. But what we recommend is when you're writing those kinds of essays for the additional information section or the additional questions section, um, keep the problem part to no more than one quarter or one fifth of the essay. Keep it short and simple and then spend most of the essay saying how you've turned the situation around. Because colleges are trying to understand, you know, are we going, they're asking themselves, are we going to have the kind of support that is needed to help this student and to, you know, to, to make sure that this student succeeds at our institution. So, um, you know, obviously you're not going to lie, but what I'm saying is it's sometimes it's about proportion in an essay, because remember, they don't know you. All they see is what's written on the page. So make sure that your message, uh, you know, certainly uh, has the, the, a majority of the component on the solution. Okay. Um, 
Yes. So a uh, gap year question. Um, if I don't have an idea what my major should be in my senior year, do you recommend I take a sabbatical, which is the same as like a gap year? That can be a great option, right? But provided that the gap year is well organized, you want to do, um, you know, we've had students who've taken gap years. Uh, we've helped them plan it. Uh, we had a student last year who uh, did um, a internship in a company um, he's half uh, Peruvian, and he did an internship for the first part of his gap year at a company in Peru. Um, he wanted to go into business, and he was able to secure this through his family. And anyway, so what you want is to plan that gap year in a way that's going to help you make some of these decisions down the line. Okay. Um do I have to have safety schools, Rochely? Do I have to have safety schools and not all Ivy universities when I apply to college? Um, so try to avoid the idea of safety, focus on probability, okay? It's really a numbers game. So in our, when we work with students, we try to make sure that no matter which super selective schools they're working, uh, they're applying to, uh, they have a solid base of schools with admission rates above 70% and schools with admission rates between 50 and 70%. So targets and likely schools. If you do that, then, um, you know, then you can add layer on top of that, your reaches and what we call the lotteries, which are uh, the schools that are, um, you know, uh, basically reject more students than they accept. Okay. Um, the websites to look for the smaller uh, private scholarships. Yes. So um, actually, if, if you could simply, um, yeah, so, so one of them is fast web and the other one, there's scholarships.com and there's also go marry. It's not was not be Mary. Apologize. It was go Mary. G O M E R R Y. Okay. Um, if you move schools junior or senior year, does that tend to be a problem? How would you deal with this? Yeah. So the important thing always when you have changes in your progression, where you change schools or you graduated early or you decide to take a gap year, whatever it is make sure that colleges understand why, right? There are all sorts of great reasons, right? Including that the school that you moved from is not a great fit. Um, on the Common App, you have 250 words to write that, that essay. Uh, and take your time and be sure that you focus on the solution. You can say what the problem is, but keep it to one quarter, really maximum of that essay. Um, yeah, so so somebody's asking about, you know, I have ADHD and should I talk about it? And if I do, will it decrease my chances of getting into the school I want? So again, you know, we're not telling people uh, definitely don't talk about uh, learning differences. If that is a significant part of your story, um, then, you know, you can certainly incorporate it. What we recommend is that when you write an essay like that, um, if you feel that it really is intrinsic, intrinsic to understanding who you are and um, challenges overcome, for example, then make sure that you keep the struggles to a short part of the essay, like one quarter or one third maximum. And the rest needs to show, you know, how you have overcome, what you have done to um uh, to be able to uh, handle these, uh, uh, you know, the whatever challenges have come up. Okay, one more question. Um, how to avoid out-of-state costs? Great question. So luckily, uh, some colleges offer merit scholarships that uh, make it so that the out-of-state costs is nearly the same as the in-state cost. How do you do that? Well, that's what the topic of this uh, of this webinar was all about. 
It was all about how to maximize uh, merit scholarships and uh, maximize admission results. It's about the story you tell. It's about the it's about the profile you develop. It's about how you showcase your strengths. It's about the choices you make for summers. There are just so many factors that go into maximizing scholarships. Um, but don't look at a college's sticker price and think that that's what you're stuck with, okay? Um, a book that I recommend that you all read is called uh, Who Gets In and Why by Jeff Salingo. Who Gets In and Why? Because the uh, cost of college, the discount, and some of these merit scholarships are discussed at great length. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. And uh, hopefully we'll see uh, a lot of you at the um, uh, discovery session. Uh, please, um, Sydney, if you could just put, put that link in. If you're a student, please bring your parent. And if you are a parent, please bring your spouse. Thank you so very much for attending. See you soon. Bye-bye.